Well, everybody, welcome to Carbon Cowboys Conversations. This is the inaugural version. And my name is Peter Bick, and I'm a filmmaker and a professor of practice and a wrangler of scientists. I work here at Arizona State University, and I run a, a 501c3 called Carbon Nation. And I am so honored to look at the screen right now and see you three gentlemen on there. Um, I, I, I'm beside myself, quite frankly. I've been faking it while we've been warming up. I'm, I'm bubbling here. Um, so we've got Gabe Brown, Will Harris, and Alan Williams. If there was a Mount Rushmore of people who are trying to make this world better, uh, Neil Dennis would already be carved up there, and then you guys, the scaffolding would be up there carving your all's faces. Um, so while we do a quick intro, I'll let you all do a quick intro. And, and what I want to do today is have a conversation. So Will, you got a question for Alan. Great. Alan, you got a question for me. Great. Et cetera, et cetera. So Gabe, why don't you give us just a short, brief intro of, of, of who you are and where you are? So my name is Gabe Brown, and I'm a rancher near Bismarck, North Dakota, up here in God's country. And We've been practicing regenerative agriculture, although we didn't call it that back then, since the, the mid-1990s. And we raise uh, pastured proteins of all types, grass-finished beef, lamb, pastured pork, uh, uh, laying hens on pasture, broilers, along with some uh, uh, small grain crops, which, which are fed to the hogs and chickens, and we're just living the dream. Awesome. Will, why don't you jump in now, sir? Will Harris, White Oak Pastures, Bluffton, Georgia. Uh, our farm is a multi-generational, multi-species, vertically integrated farm. Similar to Gabe, we're, we aspire to be Gabe Brown and uh, doing all we can to get there. That's probably never we'll make it. We raise cows, hogs, sheep, goats, poultry and process them on the farm and uh, probably here with you all today. I'm, 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 I'm on them. Yeah, I'm right there with you. And, 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 and Alan, what, what you got? Well, again, good to be here, Peter, and uh, sixth generation uh, farmer. And we uh, farm in Mississippi and Alabama now. Uh, again, like Gabe and Will, multi-species of so poultry, pigs, sheep, cattle, market gardens all of those types of things. Uh, also a partner in Joyce Farms. Uh, and so we're very heavily into the regenerative agriculture and, and pastured protein sector and proud to be here with you. Awesome. So uh, we're, we're celebrating the opening of our, of our documentary Carbon Cowboys. And the, the film, feature length film is broken into 10 paddocks. And the first one that we filmed was Soil Carbon Cowboys that Gabe and Alan are in with Neil Dennis, who we lost in 2018. And then Alan's in a couple of other films, uh, one in North Georgia called This Farm is Medicine, and one in South Carolina called Givers and Takers. And then I got down to spend three days with, with Will, and we filmed a film called 100,000 Beating Hearts. So I've, I've gotten to be uh, knowledgeable about the work you all do because you were kind enough to open up your lives to me, especially Alan and Gabe, because you guys didn't know me at all. And um, there was no film you could look back on to say, okay, he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, okay, he's not going to make me say things I didn't say and all that kind of stuff. And then with Will, you'd seen Soul Carbon Cowboys and you wanted to make a film better than that, I think is what you said to me. Um, and it is, and it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so now we brought all these short films as part of a project that, to teach the world how important soil health is. And, and for me, I honed in on soil health because I honed in on grazing because it seemed to be the biggest bang for the buck. It seemed to be the quickest way to get there. So let me open it now. Um, uh, I want to talk about soil health. I want to talk about the state of our soils in the United States right now and, and what you all are building and why. So Gabe, why don't you start us off and then just, we'll just toss it around. Soil health. Sure. So we're really seeing over the past, especially three to five years, ironically, since Soil Carbon Cowboys first came out, a real emphasis on the need for society as a whole to look at soil health and 
I don't care if your interests are in climate change, soil health plays a role in that. I don't care if your interests are in uh, clean water, clean air, soil health certainly plays a role in that. If your interest lies in human health, soil health certainly plays a role in that. And I look at soil health as a way to bring society together. You know, we don't have to agree on everything, but certainly all of us as society can agree that soil health is important and we need to focus on that as a society. And will our, our soils healthy, United States? As no, a whole? No, by and large, no. If, if, if the land has been uh, farmed, uh, I'm, I'm gonna use the word conventionally, industrially, using a lot of tillage, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, no, the soil is not healthy. It's degraded into a dead mineral medium as opposed to being a living organic environment that's teeming with life. And uh, I'd like to add, I agree with everything Gabe said, and I'd like to add another benefit to help the soil is revitalizing the local rural community. You know, industrial agriculture rendered small rural communities as irrelevant, made them irrelevant. And uh, the, the way that the three of us farm and others, the, the relevancy is back and then the towns are starting to thrive again. I'm very proud of that. That's important. So Alan, what, what do you want to add to what we've just talked about? Well, Gabe and I get the benefit of traveling all over North America. And we have, we have seen farm after farm, ranch after ranch. And I can tell you, you know, Will's response that by and large soils are not healthy is absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, there are many soils across North America are severely degraded, not just a little bit degraded, but severely degraded. And, and I'm going to add one more factor to what Gabe and Will said about the benefits of healthy soil. The, the one thing that I think gives uh, us the most pleasure and the most satisfaction is the fact that when we are able to rebuild truly healthy, vibrant, biologically active soils, that it also creates a vibrancy of life all around us. And you see the farmers and ranchers coming alive, their quality of life, the, what they experience on a day-to-day -day basis absolutely changes. So their morale, their demeanor, everything about them changes for the better. And, and, you know, Gabe said it earlier, healthy soil is the foundation for health for everything and everybody. I'm going to pick up on what you just said about health for the farmer. And, you know, from what I understand, the group with the highest rate of suicide in the United States right now is farmers. And I think that's, I mean, you don't want any group to be high in suicide, but farmers, the people who produce our food are in that much stress. I assume it's debt stress, um, but I don't know. I'll open it up to you all. That's, it, it's shocking to me. And so tell me, tell me your thoughts about that. And um, whoever wants to start her off. I, I wrote an article about that not too long ago, Peter. And, um, and received a tremendous amount of response from that, not just from people outside of farming and agriculture, but also from farmers themselves. It was quite amazing how many farmers I heard from that admitted to me that they had had serious bouts of depression. So yes, the heavy debt load is certainly one of the factors that contributes to that. But the other is that, and, and this alludes back to something that Will said, you know, when they feel forced to use a lot of tillage, to use a lot of chemicals and synthetics and so forth, that, that truly does something to your soul as a farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's very negative. And, you know, you can't go long knowing that you're, you're doing damage to the soil and you're doing damage to life around you without it's significantly impacting everything about you. So it, it, it's, it's sad that this is a profession 
that among any profession in the world and in any time in the world should be among the most esteemed and have the deepest level of satisfaction. But yet we have farmers, not just here in the US, but globally that are now having high rates of suicide. And unfortunately, during this pandemic, if you're a conventional farmer, Peter, it's gotten even worse. When you're having to stare euthanizing tens of thousands of pigs a day in the eye, when you're having to stare euthanizing chickens, you know, and in, in aborting sows and, and, and not getting paid for what you're producing, um, that's incredibly damaging. And, and we're going to see yet another record high number of farm bankruptcies filed here in 2020. Well, you've just brought up COVID, COVID nineteen. So let's let's go there. Um, uh, Gabe, let's start with you. What has this event, this pandemic, how's it affected your life and your business right now? The current pandemic, I think, has really shed a light on a lot of the quote unquote ills of the current production model. You know, the three of us have been touting for years that we need more localized, regionalized food systems that where you get to know your farmer and rancher and truly know where your food comes from. From our ranch's standpoint, uh, COVID-19 uh, has caused a, a sharp increase in business because consumers are becoming more or more aware hey, we want to know where our food comes from how that food was grown and raised and we want to get to know our local farmer so it's been very good from a local ranch standpoint from our business understanding ag standpoint which Alan and I are, are partners in uh, it has really shed to light just what Alan talked about. The current crisis that many in agriculture are seeing. And we're being contacted on a daily basis by individuals, uh, farmers, ranchers who are struggling. And so I look at, at the pandemic as kind of a a perfect storm, so to speak, and I, I hate to use that word because we certainly don't want to dismiss all the tragedy that's come about from the virus, but it's really, you need to look at it through the set of eyes of, okay, what does this mean? The future is changing, you know, there will be a new normal. And so how do we as farmers and ranchers and consumers take part in that new normal. Will, can you give us a sense of what the food supply chain looks like? I imagine there's a number of people watching today that might not know so much about it. Um, and, then, and then we can talk about how it's fallen apart right now. Sure. So a lot like Gabe, uh, nobody hates the loss of health and loss of wealth and even loss of life that this pandemic has brought any more than I do. With that in mind, it's uncomfortable to say that it, it has been good for my business. Uh, I lost all of my food service business uh, because restaurants just aren't open much anymore. But I didn't have much food service business. Our online direct-to-consumer business has increased exponentially. And that's the part of our business that we are most interested in growing so we, the matter of fact is it's just been good for our business. We've struggled to keep up with it. And I think that uh, the, the, the new normal that Gabe referred to, I hope is a focus on the lack of resiliency in the industrial commodity centralized food system that we've been operating under for the last 70 years. That system has done a fantastic job building in efficiency and taking cost out of production and distribution. It's just incredible what 
what they've done or we've done to the extent I was part of it. But it, it was at the expense of resiliency. <clears throat> and today, you know, I, I, tell, uh, I tell my folks that help run this company, we're not part of a food production delivery system. We are a food production delivery system. And I certainly would not be arrogant enough to say that nothing can go wrong in our system. It certainly can. There's a lot of resilience left. We can continue to produce food with a lot of adversity in the system, whether it's man-made or natural or uh, pathogenic or economic or whatever else. So I hope that realization uh, in, in consumers will help create this new normal we're, we're talking about. So I look at it as resiliency, like we look at distributed power. So the folks who want to get solar panels on everyone's house so that if the main uh, power plant dies out, you've got power still out there. And, and I look at the food system as we need to be more resilient. But in a way, Will, you took me on a tour around Bluffton and you showed me in every little town around you, there was an abattoir in that town, which made me realize how many you know, processing facilities there must have been, you know, 70 years ago. Georgia has 159 tiny little counties, and every county had at least one local abattoir. Wow. So uh, now there's uh, what, uh, Alan, you probably know the number, something like uh, 50 that, that process 90% of the food or the meat and poultry in this company, something without effect. Yeah, and, and, and there's a reason why the little ones went out of business. You know, we, we own a red meat processing plant and a poultry plant. But the, and our red meat plant, it, it cost us something like $400 to slaughter and process a, uh, a cow. Maybe a little more than that now. Uh, a big industrial plant that kills uh, thousands of head per shift can do it for less than $100. So fourfold more expensive when it's all about how the race to the bottom on how cheap you can produce it. The, the, the big ones win and the little ones lose, but it's at the cost of resilience, the lack of resilience. So Alan, fill in the gaps of, of how the, the, the system has been working in this country and where we got to, and then bring it back to the idea that, that folks who are selling directly to customers like you all three do, how your sales have been uh, increased during COVID. Yeah, so as Will said, you know, over the last several decades, this system was built that has been touted globally as one of the most highly efficient ag production and food systems in the world. But yet in the midst of a pandemic like this, when, when met with that challenge, the chinks in the armor of that system began to show very quickly. It started with uh, weak links in transportation, and then it bled through to weak links in cold storage capacity. Uh, your retail grocery chains, your restaurants, institutional food service, all of those built out their cold storage capacity based on just-in-time delivery. So they were so used and they were trained through the years to just pick up a phone, you know, place an order, and the next day a truck shows up. So even if we could solve the weak link of the transportation issue, they still could not hold any more than two to four days worth of food at any given time. So that certainly is, is a huge fault for local food distribution for local populations. And then, of course, the third chink in the armor showed when these plants started getting high rates of, of coronavirus cases. And that was inevitable because these plants, as Will said, slaughter many thousands of animals a day. It's impossible to social distance within these plants because they are, it's assembly line fashion, they are standing literally shoulder to shoulder and they must to have that efficiency and capacity. They don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. And if they try to quote social distance, then they're going to immediately be operating at under 50% capacity. And 
And so what's happening right now is that plants are either operating significantly below capacity in terms of these major plants or they're shut down. And that is creating the looming meat shortage that the consumer is getting ready to experience. Now on the flip side, you know, well, and let me, let me say one more thing about that, Peter, and, and it's that, that that rancher, that farmer that is supplying that segment of the industry is now suffering enormously. They have no place to go with their pigs, no place to go with their chickens, no place to go with their cattle. And, and when they do have a place to go with them, they're getting a price that is absolutely untenable. It's so low. But at the same time, the prices for all of these products in the grocery store has doubled, tripled, and quadrupled, and will be going up even more in the coming months. So how do you rectify that, you know, both as a producer and as a consumer? But as Gabe said, on the flip side, what we are experiencing within the direct market sector, the regenerative agriculture sector, is that we have seen our sales increase anywhere from 400 to over 1200 uh, percent. As we look at people all across the country that are doing this, our demand has gone through the roof and it's continuing to do so. But however, because we lost a lot of the small processing capacity all over the country in these last several decades, we're now hitting a processing bottleneck ourselves, not because of coronavirus issues in those plants, because they're experiencing little to none, okay? But because of the fact that we have overwhelmed that capacity, so we of not those, of those small packers of the small meat packers exactly we've yeah. quickly overwhelmed their capacity so we need to rebuild infrastructure in two critical ways here we need to have more regenerative farmers and ranchers that are doing what we're doing but we need to rebuild this critical i call it processing of the middle you know we've just like fred kershman's ag of the middle we need to rebuild that capacity and have that capacity like it once was, Will said 159 plus abattoirs once existed in the state of Georgia. We need to rebuild that capacity in every state. And when we have something like this occur again, and it will, then we now can quickly mobilize and very efficiently and effectively deliver food to everybody in our communities. So, so Gabe, do you think that people are coming to buy more of your, first of all, are you seeing, you're seeing an increase in sales, correct? Definitely. Can you put a number on it? Like Alan was just saying, are you double, triple, or do you know yet? Or? Oh, I would have to ask Paul, but okay. I would say uh, easily 500%. Okay. Yeah. And do you think people are coming to you just because they can't find food in the grocery store? Or, or like, why are they going to you, do you think? No, here in North Dakota, realize uh, you can walk into any grocery store. There's no shortages. The, the shelves are all full, except for toilet paper. That's the only magical thing that there's a shortage of. Everything else, the meat cases are all full. They're coming, I believe, because part of COVID-19, you look at who is unfortunately succumbing to the virus, it's those with a weakened immune system. And more and more consumers are starting to realize that food is health. And so they want to source food that is grown on regenerative soils, in regenerative soils, in they know the practices that that farmer or rancher is using in growing that food or raising that, that food in the case of livestock. And so that's what we've seen as a, as a real marked increase in the number of people looking at food as health. And I think that's an, a good thing. I think it's only going to continue. And I think that's where regenerative agriculture really shines. Now, we're involved with, with several uh, businesses and, and clients that are looking at that. How do we quantify the nutrient density of food 
and then compare it, how it's growing across different production practices. As we do that, that'll accelerate uh, this movement towards uh, sourcing food that's grown in a regenerative model. So Gabe, um, I think it was in 2015, you and Paul, your son, who you just mentioned, who's now running your farm with you or running your farm for you or running your farm and you're just- No, he's the boss. Yeah. <laughs> um, he right. and you and I, you guys were researching co-ops and we were in Albuquerque and we went to a co-op in Albuquerque and this guy was watering all the vegetables. And he told me, I don't know if you guys, you probably already knew it, but he really uh, influenced me. He said, listen, my family tells me that all these vegetables here in this co-op, this organic place are all too expensive. But then I asked my family, the guy who works there, he says, I asked my family, how much do you spend on medicine? And that shuts him up. And I tell them that if you put your medicine costs and your food costs in the same bucket, that cheap food that, that Will was talking about, how we've been racing to the bottom on that cheap food, all of a sudden it's not so cheap when you include those two things. Um, so that was something I learned with, with you a couple of years ago. I talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and we're seeing that. Uh, I'll give you another incident that occurred uh, Paul and I were at the farmer's market and a gentleman walked up to to our concession trailer and was looking at the prices and the products and he said, boy, your meat is higher priced. And before we could answer him, the gentleman standing beside it, behind him said, let me tell you what, I just had a triple bypass. This meat is cheap. And we thought, hey, that that's perfect analogy. But one of the things we've been doing is actually testing the nutrient density of our products, everything we grow and raise on Brown's Ranch. And what we find, we compare that with other products that consumers have available to them. We are consistently, without a doubt, significantly higher in, for instance, the essential fatty acids and higher in omega-3s. Uh, we tested uh, ribeye steaks that had an omega-6 to 3 ratio of 1.3 to 1. Think about that. That is unheard of. What's that in mean? Pastured protein industry. A and so for, for beef. And you compare that to much of the quote unquote conventionally raised beef, that's often 15 to 1 or higher even. And so consumers are coming to producers like us because they truly want nutrient dense food. Can we scale this? Can we, can, can, can the American agricultural system scale regenerative ag to, to feed more and more and more of us? Can it happen? Will? You know, one of the oh, things okay. uh, I often get asked that question and I tell people, well, well, look at what's being produced in a conventional model. It's a monoculture. They're only growing one crop or else they only have one species of livestock. You look at what Will and Alan and myself and many, many others are doing. We not only can grow a crop, but we have beef, we have pork, we have poultry, uh, turkeys, guineas. We're just stacking enterprise on top of enterprise. We will produce many more calories of nutrient dense food per acre than will any monoculture type model. And, and I, I talk about that. I, I say that I haven't seen very much research when people talk about how much food we can produce on how much land. I haven't seen, pretty, I haven't seen very much research where it says anything about stacking an enterprise like, like you all do. You all grow many different things on the same land. Now, to my knowledge, you all do it with rainfall. Like, I don't think I've seen irrigation where you guys are farming. Um, Will, you, you've been chomping at the bit here. Let's, let's listen to you. Well, I, I, I was, uh, I agree with what, what's been said. It, it uh, <clears throat> you know, in, in the, uh, it's not all just about how many uh, calories or how much protein you produce per acre. It, it, the consideration needs to be given is what the inputs are that go to do that. You know, if it requires a tremendous amount of reductively mined phosphate and potassium, then that's, that's credited against what you're producing. A tremendous amount of petroleum, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, water if you irrigate. The, uh, 
the offsetting cost of production has got to be considerable. You know, I believe that what we do is highly replicatable. It's not highly scalable. You know, the, the, the Tyson uh, model is highly uh, scalable, but what we do is highly replicatable. You see three guys here from very different uh, ecosystems scattered around the country, and we all have programs that are working uh, efficiently, effectively in our ecosystem. And that, that can be done, I think, in every ag county in, in, the, in the country. And I just want to say that we're celebrating the start of our documentary film release, Carbon Cowboys, today, which is carboncowboys.org. And if you want to know a lot more about what these gentlemen do, that's what these films are about. You'll get to meet them in a, in a much deeper way and really understand what they're doing. Um, Alan, to get back to you, I think your mic is muted right now. There you go. Um, if you were the Secretary of Agriculture, you woke up this morning and found out you were the Secretary of Agriculture, what, what would you do? What would be your, your, your first steps? First of all, I would have to say that, thank God I'm not involved in Washington, D.C. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if, if I were, then I would have to look very, very strongly at how we can effectively and efficiently restore. It, it would be a multi-tiered approach. The first thing would be Re rebuilding our foundation, what we talked about at the beginning of our conversation today, the soil. Okay, that is the foundation. So I would have to look at how can we effectively and efficiently rebuild, repair, renovate, restore our soil and the biology of that soil. Secondly, I would have to look at how can we repair this broken food system that we have so that the vast majority of our foods do not have to travel 1500 plus miles before they reach their final destination so that we can rebuild revitalize our rural economies because they are the backbone of the economy of this country and as they fail we fail so we would have to look at how to rebuild those rural economies so that they're vibrant our communities our rural communities are vibrant and we are supporting a multiplicity of small business that then supports all of these farms. So that would mean that we're now also repairing and rebuilding our small to medium sized farm infrastructure in the US. And then of course, what I mentioned earlier, I would have to look strongly at how we effectively and efficiently rebuild that processing capacity in each and every state so that we can effectively move food from the farmer through the processing directly to the consumer. And I would also place heavy emphasis, you know, the USDA has what they call their food pyramid. And if I were the Secretary of Agriculture, and we actually had a webinar on this last night by Sarah Keogh that Anybody that has not seen that webinar needs to see it because what we really need to do is turn the food pyramid on its head. It is absolutely backwards. And if you track and trace the beginning of the levels of obesity and diabetes and heart disease and cancer and so forth in the US, it all traces back, the sudden rise in all of those things traces back to the beginning of that food pyramid. When we inverted the way that we really are supposed to eat, we created this whole host of maladies and diseases and physical impacts that are significantly harming our population today. So I would have educational efforts that go out throughout the US reteaching the consumer, the medical community, dietitians, nutritions, everybody involved in food, how we really should eat for ultimate health. Is this when they said fat was bad? Is that basically the, the gist of the inverted food pyramid or is it something more detailed yeah, than that? It, it started with Dr. 
a, a scientist by the name of Dr. Ansel Keys in the 1930s and 40s and, and a very small group of scientists that he worked with. And, and Ansel Keys is really the originator. So it, it's almost unfathomable that we have this very small group of European scientists that, by the way, many other scientists of that day vehemently disagreed with and had data that totally was the opposite of what Ansel Keys and his group of scientists were trying to show. Uh, but yes, they were, they were basically trying to demonize fat and that started this whole deal. And, you know, they, they determined and decided that we needed far more grain in our diet. And, you know, that's supposedly the foundation for the USDA food pyramid is the highest percentage of anything consumed are the grains. And, and they demonize meat in the fats. And that precipitated these horrendous medical impacts that we have seen that continue to rise, not diminish. So the question that I would have to ask anybody is if this food pyramid was so fantastic, how come every malady known to man has increased after the implementation of this food pyramid rather than decreased? And we got margarine. I mean, oh. just that alone. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So, Will, I want to go on policy a little bit more. Um, um, what policies would you like to see different in the U.S. farm world that, uh, to my mind, we have a lot of policies that don't incentivize soil health, and I would love to see that. Do you agree, and, 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 and what would you like to see? So I, I, I would, uh, the two, as, as Secretary of Agriculture, the two tools you've got to work with is subsidies and regulations. And today, uh, I think we subsidize so many of the wrong things and ignore the right things. And we regulate in a manner that is probably uh, conducive to this centralization that we were discussing earlier. So uh, the, the two areas of emphasis would be to subsidize things like soil health and uh, uh, polycultures and these other, these other uh, directions that we've all agreed that we, we should be going in. Uh, start subsidizing the right things and stop subsidizing the wrong things is a short answer. And with regard to regulation, it would be uh, move it from driving centralization and commoditization to driving things that are more desirable. You know, the, the, the commoditization, the three, the, three, the three areas where we really destroyed our food production system was industrialization, making factory farms that are monocultures, commoditization, which meant stop making the product as good as it can be and make it meet the minimum standards. And then centralization, which we've talked about, is these huge plants that slaughter 400 head per hour, 1,000 head per hour. So movement back away from those things through what we subsidize and what we regulate is the answer to your question. All right. Gabe, you got anything you'd like to add to the policy piece? They both summed it up real well. The only thing I would add is an educational component for farmers and ranchers. Alan talked about the education component for consumers, but one of the things we're seeing as we're out and travel is just that uh, farmers and ranchers are hearing the wrong story, the wrong message. You know, it's, it's hard for us to get down on farmers and ranchers when land grant universities and extension and uh, all these large uh, companies just bombard them with information as it only relates to the current, as Will says, industrialized, commoditized production model. They're not educating themselves and they're not, not being educated as to really how soil ecosystems function. How does a healthy water cycle occur? How does a healthy mineral cycle, nutrient cycle occur? So education has to be a large component. One of the problems, you know, there are some, I will say decent programs within the USDA. The problem is 
farmers and ranchers do not receive the education as to why these practices are important and why they need to implement them on their farms and ranches. We talked about it earlier when we were talking about stacking enterprises. I want to make sure we really make that point clear. Uh, Jerry Hatfield, who uh, is with the, was with, is with the USDA. I think he's still there. Um, he taught me the term um, profit per acre, not yield per acre. And, and, and um, Gabe, can you pick that up? That, that whole idea of, and Will talked about inputs and how expensive it can be. And we talked about debt and suicide rates and all those things build into that one adjustment of the farmer's perspective. Yeah, and Will is exactly right. It is profit per acre. You know, Alan and I and our team with Understanding Ag, when we go work with a new client, we have to more or less tell them they've got to do a complete 180. They've had yield and pounds. That's all that's been ingrained in their minds. We start talking differently. Let's start talking about profit per acre. And we, we like to sit down with the whole family and start talking about that because I tell you right away, the wives, their ears perk up because <laughs> That, that's one of the reasons, too, for the high suicide rate is the financial burden. It's more out on the whole family. And the wives, you know, they're supposed to feed a family and, and buy what they need for that household on a smaller and smaller budget. Well, when we start talking about profit per acre and about putting themselves first, then we can really move forward. So, so we need to go into these farms and ranches and find out we need to get rid of the excess. Where are they spending money foolishly? And what, what is it uh, truly costing them to produce a bushel of grain, a pound of beef, et cetera? And then how can we take advantage of these stacked enterprise systems to add more income uh, and increase profitability to their operations? Gentlemen, you want to add anything, Will or Alan, to that? Just the one thing that I would say is that uh, over okay. and over again, what we have experienced with, with our own farms and, and clients who are doing multi-species or stacked enterprises, as we like to call them, they are producing far more food per acre than any commodity farm can even think about producing. And Will, were you going to add to that, sir? Yeah, uh, I was going to say that the, the shift, I think, occurred when we stopped thinking of farms as ecosystems and started thinking of them as factories. It's, it's a completely different mindset. You know, reductionist science did so well for Henry Ford producing Model T automobiles that we applied it to everything. The reductionist science does not work very well in a complex system. On a farm, it's a bone, it's a complex system. When a young farmer, let, let's say someone's watching this, this, this webinar right now. Young farmer doesn't own land, land's expensive, but really wants to grow food. There's a lot of people right now that really want to grow food. They might not be young. You might get mid-career folks who just like get out of the office, they want to grow food. How can they get a leg up? How can they start? Uh, Gabe, do you want to start up? Sure. So for 25 plus years, we've had an internship program on our ranch where, where we bring in interns in order to educate them, in order to help us with the daily tasks. And I always tell the interns, one, we often hear, oh, I want to buy land. And I tell them, don't do that. That's the worst thing you can do mm -hmm. starting out. You start small with what you enjoy doing, but what you can make a profit at. And then you grow as your profits grow. And you start saving money and look for the next opportunity. And those opportunities will come along. Often there's a, a couple who does not have uh, children or, or others who want to be a part of their operation. Go offer to help them. Take your operation with you. I always say make your operation portable or you can move it from place to place. You grow, you acquire capital and you save. And then when the opportunity is right, if it 
becomes available at the right price, then you can buy land. But grow one step at a time, learn as, as you're going and as you can become proficient and knowledgeable in what you do. Don't be obsessed with this buying land. The other thing is we see it all the time. We see very, very profitable operations on small landscapes, an acre or two or less. Uh, I often get asked, well, how many acres do you need to make a living? And I tell the people, well, you give me a backyard garden and, it, and I, there's no doubt I can make a living at it. You know, it's all a mindset. And so you have to have the right mind and then move forward accordingly. Alan, you want to add anything to that? Well, like, like Gabe, we have interns and apprentices and so forth. Will does as well. And there actually are more ways now for young people to get into agriculture than ever before because of regenerative agriculture and the, and the ability to direct market to the consumer. That has created this whole host of opportunities that frankly didn't exist you know, uh, earlier. And, and there are numerous ways, you know, very inventive and innovative ways that, that young people can get involved. Like Gabe said, there, there's a lot of aging farm families whose children don't want to come back to the farm that they can take advantage of. But there are also quite a few farms that they, they only want to produce what they're currently producing but would love to have the impact of multi-species and so forth on their farms. Mm -hmm. And so this opens up an opportunity for young people to be able to utilize that land that they do not own to be able to build their own business while at the same time adding to the fertility and the soil health of the farm that they're using. Will, do you have like an intern, and all y'all, do you, do you have an internship sort of like alumni association? And do you know where all your interns are? And can you kind of look at, at, at that part of your legacy, that part of what you've given? And, well, and it's, not, it's not that formal, but yes, we do keep up with uh, most of the people that have come through here. Most of them uh, become friends and family. And, and one of the things that's in, interested me about that is almost – to, to a person, when they come here, it's about owning my own farm, as, as both these other guys referred to. And quite often, that evolves into just being part of a regenerative program. You, you, you might own it, but you don't have to own it. And if you have a passion for aerospace, that doesn't mean you come out of college and start a, uh, a, a spaceship company. You, know, you go to work at a spaceship company. One of the things, we, we hire a lot of our interns, uh, a lot, and what happens is they, they learn that they have a passion for sheep or chickens or vegetables or eggs or whatever, hogs, whatever species, and they don't have a, a passion for being a mechanic and an accountant and a veterinarian and all these other things that are necessary. If they go to work here because they really like going out, you know, today I'm going to uh, plant squash and they get out there and the tractor won't crank. So they're the mechanic for the day. Well, here they call the mechanic and he brings them another tractor and they plant squash. <laughs> so that's, uh, we wound up hiring a lot of our uh, interns because it's well, quite honestly, it's just, unless you get the passion for sailing your own ship, it's just, pretty practical to go to work with us already a ship and sale. I want to talk about big companies right now, big food companies. Um, we've been saying industrial agriculture, industrial agriculture, centralize this, centralize that. So there's, that's the big companies are the ones who are profiting from that. I myself am in a really cool collaboration with McDonald's. We're leading a large research project and McDonald's is our lead funder. And um, I can tell you in my conversations with them that they would be agreeing with everything that they're hearing right now. And yet we're in such a big different places of where we're at and where we want to go, but how can we get there? You all, uh, 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 
Gabe and Alan specifically, you're wearing your, you're wearing your swag right now. You're understanding ag hats and shirts and everything. You haven't given us any, but that's fine. Um, you all are working with General Mills is, is what I know. And so what's your experience with General Mills and, and what's your take on, are they for real? Are they really moving the needle? Do they like what you guys are doing? What, how is that going? Sure. Uh, we've had the good fortune the past two plus years to work with General Mills. They approached us because of something that I said earlier. They, they were seeing a lack of education given to producers. Uh, as producers move down the regenerative path, they, they need to understand these principles of ecosystem health and how to adopt those principles. So they came to us whether we would be interested in working with them on a pilot project, moving producers down the regenerative path. It has been absolutely amazing to me to see th that company's mindset grow as to the importance of regenerative agriculture. I've had the good fortune that I've been at their world headquarters in Minneapolis a number of times now. And as you pull up to the parking lot, you actually walk on the pathway up to the main building and they have cover crops planted along that pathway with signs as to what each individual species is and what that species does, the importance of it in an ecosystem. When you walk into that main building painted on the wall is the words regenerative agriculture. That's how much they are taking this to heart. And they know that in order to get the constant high quality of supply of products they need, it's important that farmers and ranchers are profitable and understand regenerative agriculture and grow those grains, those products, in healthy soil. So it's been a very rewarding experience for us. And I feel they'd say the same thing also. Alan, do you have anything to add on General Mills to what Gabe said? Yeah, I, I, I would totally concur with what Gabe said. Uh, they have been an amazing partner and they are quite serious. Uh, and they've also been very transparent very open and honest, you know, they, they said, look, we're, we're, we're a global company, you know, we, we provide food to billions of people a year and, and we recognize and realize we can't just transition to all regenerative products overnight. And they're right, they can't, you know, neither can someone like McDonald's, uh, but yet you've got to start somewhere. You've got to take that first step. And, and so, you know, we're willing to help anybody, any company, that is willing to start down this path because it's, it's critical, it's important. And they have a very profound impact on a lot of the farming and ranching community just because of their size and, and their name. And so if they get involved, if they get behind this as they are, then they have tremendous influence on, on thousands of farmers and ranchers and can greatly move this pendulum the right way much more quickly. So we're, we're just very, very thankful and grateful for these types of relationships and, and we welcome more of them. When, when I met you all, in, uh, oh, Will, go ahead, go ahead, buddy. Uh, I agree with what these guys said. I, I've had a wonderful relationship with General Mills specifically. They actually pay for very expensive life cycle analysis uh, on my farm that I could not have <clears throat> paid for myself. So I have the same experience, but I also uh, want to uh, be sure we understand you can't put all these companies in the same basket. The experience we've had with General Mills, I have found to be the exception. You know, I could name you a number of pariah companies that have done more to damage regenerative agriculture than any of us have done to promote it. And they've done, that's been done through uh, greenwashing that devalues what we do. And it's, it's just been a, 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 a horrible thing to, to witness occurring. And sadly, there, I see more of that than I do the General Mills sort of efforts that we've been describing. 
I hear you. Thank you for that. Um, one of the things I found when I, when I made the first part of this documentary, uh, the Soil Carbon Cowboys part, people would say, yeah, it's working in Mississippi, North Dakota, and Saskatchewan, but it wouldn't work in Alabama. And, and yeah, I'm sure it won't work in Texas. And, and Alan, tell me what you tell farmers that come to your uh, Soil Health Academy about that point, what I call the yeah, but syndrome. Yeah, you know, it, it's amazing. So we've worked with farmers and ranchers all over the world, and every one of them tells us that. No matter where they are, they all have a yeah, but right? A reason why it will not work wherever they are, whether it's their soil, their climate, whatever it may be. So whenever we start an academy, one of the first things that I tell them is that exactly that, that we hear that all the time. And so this is our ground rule to start the academy. You are not allowed to say this will not work here because. Rather, you can ask, you are allowed to ask, how can I make that work here? Now we have a basis for a dialogue and a discussion and the path to move forward. Gabe, have you ever seen a place where regenerative agriculture did not work? No, and I, I have uh, often, as I'm out speaking, because we hear that so much, I tell them, I'll, I'll never forget back in 2012, I was speaking in, in uh, Southern Australia, one of the toughest crowds I've ever spoke to. And I was having a tough time and they were actually heckling. And finally I had enough, you know me, I'm just gonna say what I think. And I said, I'll tell you what, I will bet any one of you out here, your farmer ranch against mine that I can get it to work on your farmer ranch. And right then they just shut up and they started listing. And I'm serious about that because these are the principles of nature. This isn't rocket science. These are the principles of nature. Anywhere where there's land-based agriculture, these, these principles will work. Will, did you have anything to add to that? Or was, or was someone trying to interrupt your, uh, your, your, your time with us? Both. <laughs> So, uh, you know, what, what I would say is that, that we, have all, we, we all understand that when all the natural systems are working, nature yields an abundance. That's how all that oil and coal and gas got in the ground. It's the abundance. And we started the degradation when we broke the cycles of nature. And there are cycles of nature everywhere. I mean, it's, it's granted, it's different in... Uh, South Carolina or Texas or North Dakota and Georgia, but there are cycles of nature everywhere and everywhere it yields an abundance. So when the, I agree that what works in North Dakota doesn't work in Bluffton, Georgia, but there are cycles of nature that work and, and, and regenerating those cycles of nature works everywhere. And you've got to figure out what those cycles are, what broke, well, we know what they are, but what broke them how to get them functioning uh, effectively again, and it will yield an abundance. That's how we got here. Alan, last words, my friend. We're, we're winding down. Well, the, this has been an incredible hour. We do appreciate the opportunity. And, and what I would say is that you have to experience regenerative agriculture to know what can really happen. And once you do that, you will never turn back. The results are so amazing, so incredible that you can't go back. And it is a journey, not a destination. We have no clue what a truly healthy, vibrant soil looks like yet. We've yet to get there anywhere globally in our current world. And so just start the journey. Start the journey. You'll never regret it. I asked everybody who I film, would you go back? And they say no so quickly that I, I almost have to ask it again so that I'm not still talking. Um, well, my name's Peter Bick. This has been a Carbon Cowboys conversation with Alan Williams, Gabe Brown, and Will Harris. Uh, you guys just put a big old smile on my face. I'm so glad to know you. I'm so glad to be a part of your lives. I'm so glad you're a part of mine. 
and and um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.